Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag, where I just open my mail. Yes, we've got a ton of stuff again, beauty. Thank you everyone for sending stuff in. Let's start off with Iceland. Hi to all my Icelandic viewers. This one's from uh, Johan uh, Friedrichsen, I think. Um, he's from uh, the capital, Reykjavik, in um, Iceland. So let's check it out. We've got, oh, I'll spoil it. Why not? Oh, I can, I don't need this. It's like, oh, oh, okay. It's a wonder it made it here. Anyway, it's um, some broken electronics. What it is, I don't know. Ah, oh, postcards from Iceland. I don't even have to look at them to know that they're going to be spectacular. Are they upside down? Yes. Oh, are you kidding me? Look at that! I so want to be there. I so want to be there. Ah, oh. ah, oh. Aurora Borealis. Look at that. Look at the Aurora. Ah. Oh. What the hell am I doing sitting in here in a windowless office? Ah. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> okay, let's check out what we've got in here. Some broken. Oh, oh. Ta-da! It's an 8060! Fantastic! The famous Fluke 8060 and I have done an interview with, um, sorry I forget his name, um, on the Ampower who uh, designed the 8060 or had a hand in designing the chip and stuff like that. I'll link in the um, episode down below. I wonder if it... Uh, Wonder if it works. Well, it's oh, hey, power's up. We got something on the display. Oh, I did. There we go. Something on the display, but uh, no, it's come good. It just takes time to power on. Awesome. We'll check out the famous 8060. I lusted after this puppy um, when I saw it in the magazines. It was the duck's guts. It had like 100 kilohertz and a true RMS analog uh, bandwidth. Oh man. Warning. Seriously, crusty. <laughs> <laughs> it is seriously crusty. Haven't we had the Spectrum on here before? I'm I'm sure I'm sure we've had the Sinclair ZX Spectrum on here before. Or was it a rip-off one? I can't remember. Awesome. And just to give you an idea of how small this Sinclair computer is, look at it compared to the Fluke uh, 8060 here. And uh, for those who, you know, look, compared to a tiny little Bryman BM257 multimeter, that's how small these little uh, personal computers were back in the day. But anyway, yes, I have done a retro teardown of this uh, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, so I'll link that in down below if you haven't seen it. Assembled in Portugal. I know all my Portuguese viewers. Oh, this is what we want to see, the Fluke 8060. Oh, look at this puppy. It's just gorgeous. As I said, I lusted after this one. And you can see it's a little bit uh, crusty. You can, like it's got all the gunk on there, but you can probably uh, stand a reasonable chance of cleaning that up with one of these uh, isopropyl alcohol. Swab's getting there with a bit of elbow grease, like that, and that'll actually, uh, that'll actually come up a treat, I think. You can, uh, restore that to, well, maybe all of its former glory. I might go to town on that. And check it out, it is bang on after all these years. No worries whatsoever. None of this auto-ranging stuff, you've got to get in there and, uh, do that. Look at that! Wow! This 8060, of course, is uh, famous for being uh, super duper accurate, super duper stable and reliable. Look, 100 millivolts, no worries whatsoever. Wow! That's really... That's really something. Fantastic! <laughs> and current! Look at that! Bang on! Well, one least significant digit out. We're not going to quibble about one least significant digit, are we? Crikey. Wow. That is a Bobby Dazzler. It really is. And it's not too shabby on the resistance either. Beautiful. And just a smidgen under 1K as well. And this is actually an RS branded meter as well. There you go. I didn't know they 
Um, actually, Brandon, and that's a bit of sacrilege there. Anyway, um, yeah, this will... I think this will clean up just lot nicely, and it's going to be a Bobby Dazzler of a meter, that's for sure. Um, famously had the uh, uh, conductance as well. S stands for uh, Siemens, and you can basically one on resistance there, and it had a uh, 2000 nano Siemens uh, range that allows it to um, measure high resistance stuff. And how high a resistance could it measure? Well, on the 2000 nano sim, well, the only uh, nano Siemens range here, uh, we've got a resolution of uh, 0.01 nano Siemens. So if we go 0.01 nano Siemens, you've got to invert that on the calculator to get ohms. There you go, 10 to the power of 11, which is 100 times 10 to the power of 9, which is 100 gig ohms. So if you had a 1 there, that would equal 100 gig ohms. Of course, you know, once it goes up to 2, uh, if it goes, you know, 0.002 there, eh, 50 gig ohms, the resolution's extremely poor, of course, but hey, it allows you to measure high resistances. Very handy. Made in Holland. Love it. Hi to all my Netherlands viewers. There's a lot of them. There's a little tear down, and uh, we've got our HRC fuse in here. Uh, nine volt battery flapping around in the breeze. Never was the uh, best thing with just a battery snap there, but eh, anyway, did the business look? We've got ourselves a field calibration procedure. <laughs> if you really had to calibrate it in the field, I guess you could. But there we go. Um, is that a big uh, metal shield over that puppy? I've never done a tear down of one of these actually, so uh, be interesting to just pop the hood on there. And there she is under the uh, shielding plate, and we've got ourselves a Caddick brand, of course, one of the uh, leaders in uh, thin film resistor networks, that would be the uh, precision uh, divider network down in there. And uh, we've got another one down in here, that would most likely be a fluke one, so not sure why they, uh, they went and spun their own there, but uh, used a Caddick one down there. I don't know, some reason for it. Anyway, we've got ourselves also a Fluke True RMS converter chip. There we go, they rolled that their own. Listen to the amp hour episode, I think we might have some details on that. Of course, they're not designed to the same, uh, you know, well, the CAT standards that we have these days, they didn't have those uh, back then. It was very uh, old school in terms of input, uh, input protection and uh, Things like that, our rubber membrane, we've just got some uh, PCB contacts under there, no big deal, but I won't, I actually don't know how to get that board out of there, so I won't go to any effort to take it apart further. Once again, there'll be a custom uh, Fluke uh, surface mount chip, probably, maybe on the underside, would there be? I'm assuming it'd be surface mount, because uh, there's no surface mount stuff on here at the moment, but uh, Fluke did, uh, you know, roll their own um, surface mount uh, ASICs to do this sort of thing and then uh, combined it with uh, through hole stuff that was very common for these early fluke meters by the way we have a date code on there too 1986 so this is either 86 or maybe 87 vintage and the screw that came out of there is very interesting it's a spring stuck onto a screw like that so it goes down and makes contact down in there that's very novel I like that so thank you very much, Johan, for sending that awesome Fluke 8060 in, and I can't believe it still works. Well, actually can. A lot of them are still work, actually reasonably uh, common to find them in uh, working condition still, but fantastic meter. And um, I've sort of started to half do the uh, clean in here, and it's, it's turning up okay. So what I'm actually going to do with this is I, I think I will give it away to a beginner because I've been hoarding too much stuff here. So I'm going to give this away to a beginner. Sorry, um, Australia only, but uh, jump on over to the uh, EEV blog forum thread for this video and post a photo of your uh, lab slash workbench and uh, yeah, give me a story why you want it and it's all yours. And I'll even throw in some swabs so that you can finish cleaning it up yourself. I mean, I've got to get on and finish the rest of the mailbag. Next up, we've got one from Australia. Bloody ripper. Um, it's from Troy Wright. Good on you, Troy. He's from uh, Bayloo Park in South Australia. Sleepy South Australia. So let's see what uh, Troy has sent in here, shall we? Oh, sorry, Mr. DeLorean. I just hit it. It's a big knife. Let's... Uh, Let's crack her open. We're in like thin. Arrow, that is. It's big. 
it's heavy. Ooh. There's a note and a shirt. What's on the shirt? Let's have a look. Silicon graphics. I guess Troy's from Silicon Graphics. Awesome. Is this a bit of Silicon Graphics kit? Perhaps. Let's have a squiz. Oh no! It's for the for some other fanboys. Ta-da! It is an Apple. It is the Macintosh PowerBook 165C. This is definitely not going to be a two-minute teardown, but that will make an interesting retro teardown. Awesome! Thanks, Troy. And I suspect uh, Jobs wasn't there for this one because, well, that's... Yeah, there's no style in that at all. It is butt ugly. There's no Jonathan Ives input on that one, that's for sure. Hmm. Anyone have one of these puppies? Were they any good at the time? I don't know. Never really used a Mac. And Troy is actually from the Adelaide Hackerspace. Um, <laughs> is that what they call themselves? Uh, Monkey Tropolis? I'm not sure. Anyway, awesome name. Um, drop by if I'm ever in Adelaide. I certainly will. Apparently this uh, puppy, um, 68030 uh, processor, 1993. It was a colour display. Um, it was the first one to have a 256 colour passive matrix. None of this uh, TFT active matrix rubbish. No sorry, Bob. Whopping 20... Uh, 120 meg hard drive, SCSI. Um, expect an hour of battery life for a full charge. Wow, 3400 US in introduction, or about 5600 US these days. 8K Aussie. Wow. There you go. And apparently it still works. So here it is. Yes, I will do a separate uh, teardown video of it. So I'll keep this extremely brief. I have no idea what that connector is. All the Apple fanboys are probably screaming, yeah, I know what that is. Anyway, geez, look at that proprietary crap everywhere unbelievable that a reset switch yep because the os i guess ain't that stable right i have no idea anyway little flip down feet pop up and ta-da bob's your uncle there it is the macintosh powerbook 165c for color and we have a trackball I was always, you know, I I kind of went, but I went between trackball back in the day, between trackball and uh, the nipple. Um, I kind of liked the nipple, but I eh, trackballs. I used to have one that actually clipped on the side of my notebook, and I got really good with the thumb of using the trackball. Man, that was those were the days. Anyway, what do you prefer, nipple or balls? And by the way, no, it has no battery, so be able to power it up from uh, the DC jack here. By the way, little uh, tip, if you've got one of these, I just had a random little uh, adapter here, which maybe seems to fit. If you want to know which pin's what, and they're not uh, marked at all, then simply get your meter and just buzz it out to the, um, to the grounded... Whoop. Buzz it out to the grounded uh, part of the chassis here. No. And other one. Bingo. There we go. So bottom one, negative. There you go. Looks like it draws 11 milliamps on standby. It says uh, 5.7.5 uh, volts on the thing. So let's power it up. Where is the damn power switch? It's got to be here somewhere. There we go. Is that it? No, that's brightness and contrast. Uh -huh. Hold on to your hat, folks. That switch on the back behind the cover was the power switch. Go figure. So, yeah, stupid. You had to actually flip the cover down to get to the bloody power switch. Anyway, I don't know. It's doing something. Hmm. Twiddle your thumbs. Uh, it's drawing 1.7 amps, by the way. 7.5 volts, which is about 12 and a half watts. Aha, uh -huh, there was nothing wrong with that at all. It was just a matter of the brightness and contrast there. Check it out. We're in like Flynn. We've got a working Macintosh PowerBook 165C. What the hell can I do with it? Let's boot that up one more time for the dummies. And uh, it wasn't in English either. What is that? That looks like that's on the LCD perhaps. Geez, well, she boots up pretty quick, that's for sure. 
You know, I have no idea how to use this or uh, change it back to English at all. Hmm. Anyone know? But yeah, it's still got the original persons. They found it like in a, a roadside thing, I think he said. So yeah, they didn't bother to wipe it. So thank you very much, Tony. This is going to make an interesting Teardown Tuesday. Coming soon. Next up, one from the United States of America, from poor Bervaldi. Um, he's from Davy in Florida. <laughs> Davy, there you go, go figure. Anyway, thank you very much, Paul. Let's see what he's. Uh, just go right through it. There we go. No wackers. I got a note. Dave Jones, open. No money in there. No, just a note. That's all right. Oh, well, got something. Looks like we got. A power supply, so it's just a switch mode power supply. I have no idea. I guess I have to read the note. Um, they're not terribly exciting power supplies, I'm afraid. Sorry for you, all you switch mode power supply aficionados. Oh, they're okay. You know, it's all right. Okay, here we go. What do we got? We've got... What is that? There's a motor attached to... It's a pump. It's a pump. It's a motor. There's going to be some pumpy stuff inside. And I guess there's two ports. Why is there two ports at one end and two ports at the other? Why two? I don't know. I don't know enough about pumps. They've got some uh, rubber um, shock absorber type stuff. I guess you put that in and that goes straight to the motor box. Ah, uh -huh. apparently I have seen this before, but I forgot. I've made like, you know, like eight, nine hundred videos or something. It's ridiculous. Um, this comes from video number 542. This is from the ZD985D soldering station, which I've got and I still uh, use. It still works, uh, no problems whatsoever. That is the pump inside the thing. And this is, <laughs> yeah, I forgot because, well, it's not that interesting. That's the power supply from it. Here's the pump from the ZD985D soldering station, as I said, blog number 542, which I'll link in. Let's take a look inside and uh, see how she works. Oh, there's probably not much to it. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering why the audio might sound slightly different on this one, because I only just realised that uh, my cameras had automatic microphone gain turned on. I usually have manual and actually adjust the level and get it right in camera, but eh, I didn't want to continue i didn't want to suddenly change it and then change it in post and have it go funny halfway through so i'll continue to shoot the rest of this video in automatic mic gain well yep doesn't get much simpler than that there we go it's just got a uh, the motor with a rotating uh block there which then just uh pushes and pulls these um out of uh phase of course and then um that is what generates the suction too easy Oh, jeez, I don't know, what was I expecting? No, exactly that. And the power supply, well, yeah, it's just a power supply. Look at the NTC uh, thermistor there flapping around in the breeze. <laughs> at least they got one, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see, yes, yeah, Sancon. Never heard of them. I don't think we're going to get niche cons in these. So thanks, Paul, for sending that in. That'll go in my motor box. Yes, I have a junk bin of motor, you know, parts with, you know, motors and uh, things like that. And this both um, sucks and blows at the same time. Next up, we've got a FedEx job. FedEx usually comes from, like, someone commercial because uh, individuals usually don't uh, send FedEx. I can't, jeez. It's hard to read these carbon copy things. I actually don't know... Don't know what it is. Oh, <laughs> okay. Is it? Really? Okay, so be it. It is. I have TR. It, um, uh, Turkish. TR? Is, is TR the uh, domain for um, Turkey? I'm not entirely sure. But what we've got is... Oh, I've got a note. And what we've got is, whoa, oh, yeah, um, they haven't made it intact. Um, I've got a whole bunch of, it's falling everywhere, crumbs everywhere. Thank you very much. It's, I have no idea. 
I have no idea. Let me read. Thank you for your great contribution to the community. You made a significant change in our lives. Thank you. Istanbul, sorry. But, um, TR? Yeah. Anyway, Istanbul. I don't want my Istanbul viewers. I wonder how many there are. P.S. He's lived in Canberra for a year and love and loves us. Ollie's. It's from Ali. Aussies. It's from Ali. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, from Istanbul. Wow. They're Istanbul something or others. I have no idea because I can't read it. Majur Safanbulu Look at no. I'm, oh, Turkish Delights. Okay. They're Turkish Delights. Awesome. Thanks. There is an art to sending stuff through the mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oops. I got a little bit crushed, but I'm sure they're still yummy. Awesome. And for those in Australia, we've got the very familiar Altronics box. This one is um, sent to me by Altronics. They said that uh, they would send a gift for Sagan. So thank you very much because they saw a video of um, Sagan. Here we go. I'll uh, show it here. So a video of Sagan uh, playing around in um, the Altronics part straws a while back. That was a really long time ago. So he sent something. Oh, a few things. Got a bargain basement sale at Altronics. Very nice store at Altronics here in Sydney. They don't, they're not everywhere. They're only, they've only got one in Sydney. They've got like one in each state. I think they have a few in Perth because that's where they're from. Um, but uh, Altronics, um, what is, what is that? Some sort of torch, LED torch thing? I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to stick some batteries up its clacker. But uh, what we've got is a spin effects. What's a spin effects? It spins. Oh, it's something right. It's a it's a spinny thing. It feels counterweighty or magnetic. Do I have to read the instructions? What does that do? That goes in there. The whole thing just fell apart. Oh, we just got a tear down. <laughs> there, that's. It's held together with super glue. Um, not super glue, I mean hot melt. So look, we've got four magnets. There we go. We've got four magnets there. And um, obviously it just sits on there and then just spins around. And uh, so let's whack that back on. Yeah, hot melt. Works wonders until it doesn't. So, oh yeah, yeah, there we go. There we go. Suspend. Oh. There we go. It suspends. I can't tip it and spin it. Woohoo! And it just spins in air. Sagan's going to like that. Whoa, yeah, you can't. There's a very fine balance for the magnetic field to keep that centered. But I wonder how long that spins for. Probably a while. I'll just leave it running. We've got one from the old Dart. This is from uh, Ian Johnson at ianjohnson.com. I think he's um, sent one in before. Uh-oh. It's going wildly out of control. It does spin for a while because it's got bugger all friction. All it's got is the uh, the air friction plus the, um, uh, plus the little steel point at the other end. So, yeah. Fail. Hmm. There we go. Have I got it? There we go. Beauty. <laughs> It'll go for a while. Thank you very much, Ian. It's temperamental. Sagan's going to like it, though. Sagan, hey, Sagan does like magnets. Ooh. Okay. Here we go. Sorry for the delay. Um, let's see what Ian has sent in. And the uh, tartan wrapper, nice. So he's from, um, did I say where he was from? He's from Stonehaven. Sounds nice. In the old... I'll get it eventually. That felt good. All right. Jeez. More tape. More tape. What's Ian sent in? IanJohnson.com. I'm sure that uh, he has sent stuff in before. I remember linking it, linking in his website. I'm sure of it. Anyway, 
Let's see what Ian sent. Bubble wrap, bubble wrap. Boom. Boom. More bubble wrap. Alright. Hey. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh. No. Oh. Wow. Okay. Is this something he's making? It is. Wow. Precision digital voltage source. Wow. Look at that. It's got a keypad and everything. Wow. Okay. Definitely. Thank you very much, Ian. We're going to... We're going to check this puppy out. And um, uh, it uses a Max 6350 reference by the looks of it. So, uh, and then some sort of uh, digital AT Mega. Anyway, awesome. Ian, let's check it out. Power. Can we power it on? No. Needs batteries. And check out this puppy. It doesn't look beautiful. I love the case and everything, how the keypad's mounted on there. And uh, ianjohnson.com, that's where you need to go if you want one of these. Although, he says, why? I just based, uh, used to replace an op-amp uh, based 0 to 10 volt version he had lying around. He's had enough parts to build a few, so the EV blog can happen. I hope you find it useful. Thank you very much. He's got to sell these. It looks neat. I love it. Unfortunately... Either there's no battery or it's run out. Hmm. Got to open it. But that's a really nice case. Funky. Gone to all the effort to... Uh, oh, that's not uh, silk screened. That is uh, Letra Set, I think. It isn't that rather neat. Maybe the reference on its own isolated board. Is it? A bit how you're doing on the 9 volt uh, battery snaps with the... You know, we haven't got like a proper holder on there. I can whack a couple of batteries in and... Uh, Otherwise, that's a little neat solution. It looks like, yeah, he's got a uh, screen cable going to the uh, front banana plugs. I'm not sure how much that's going to help, but uh, anyway, let's power it up, see what's what. And here we go. Wait five minutes for the heater to uh, heat up. Yes, because this is an ovenized uh, based. Well, I think it was, so maybe that's what that little uh, board was, perhaps. But uh, anyway, press four for four decimal places, press five for five decimal places. Oh, look at that. Ah, oh, jeez. Nice. So can we set that for, uh, well, it can go to uh, 10 volts. So let's set it for, well, 10 volts maximum there. So, hey, you know, didn't even have to press enter. That's actually a nice interface. So it's point one. Uh, there's, is there a point? Point. Yep. You've got to press the uh, star for decimal point. 1.23 volts. Nope. Nope. And hash. Nice. And let's get the fleur in here and have a look. And yep, no surprises for finding that heater there at, uh, oops, sorry about the light shadow. 41 degrees there for that little uh, heater board. Of course, you can see the uh, DC to DC. Uh, is it a D? No, it's a linear reg. They wouldn't have a DC to DC converter in there. I think it's a linear reg uh, because, you know, two 9 volt batteries you don't need. Um, you're typically going to operate this linear. You don't want any switching uh, stuff in there like that. But uh, yeah, that's a little heater board. Actually, I suspect that might be rather clever. What I think's going on here, this is a pure guess, because I actually doesn't have the schematic for the heater, I don't think. No, anyway, what's going under there is the voltage reference, which is the uh, Max um, 63 uh, five zero is an SO8 or some, you know, uh, surface mount package just mounted on the top of the board, on the top of this red board under there, just, just like the others are mounted here. And then I reckon there's a power resistor, SMD power resistor on the bottom of this double sided board. That's just an LM358, uh, op amp. So we've got some uh, transistors there and it just for a loop to keep the temperature stable, there'd be a, uh, there'd be a temperature sensor on the bottom of that as well. And I reckon and that resistor is on the top of that chip and he's cable tying them down like that. That's that's not that's not too bad at all. It's a, like a quite a cheap and simple and possibly effective way to do it. I don't know about like hot spots in the die and you know stuff like that. Only you know extensive um, aging and characteristic uh, testing would uh, determine stuff like that. But geez. That's kind of neat. I don't know how long the heat is going to last with the 9-volt uh, batteries, though.
And the other interesting thing about this is that you can just uh, hit the button here to go just increment that. So that's really rather fascinating. Now, so we've got ourselves a DAC uh, 9881 here. It's an 18 bit uh, DAC. So that works out at uh, 38.146 microvolts per bit resolution on the thing. And well, you know, you'd really have to extensively characterize this, as I said, to try and figure out whether or not. Um, uh, you know, how much effect the uh, DAC has in terms of, you know, the the stability and the linearity, you know, all sorts of parameters. Um, you know, it's not just the vo voltage reference itself uh, down here. So the DAC is going to contribute and stuff like that. But that's how you get the uh, programmable. It's probably going to be more than good enough. You know, we're only talking, well, only, you know, we're only talking four decimal places here. It's probably good enough. Let's hook it up and have a quick check. Now I've got it hooked up to my very nice Keithley DMM7510, it's a seven half digit DMM. I've only just powered up, I haven't, uh, you know, let it uh, settle or anything like that. While I've uh, just been talking, it's actually drifted, uh, drifted down a bit, but uh, basically, it's basically bang on to its uh, four uh, decimal places there. So no problems whatsoever there. So it's slowly drifting down. We could probably do some averaging and, you know, all that sort of jazz, but that's pretty good. So there we go. We'll just whack in a filter there and, geez, no whackers whatsoever. Let's whack in, uh, up. Oh, oh, no, didn't like that. Hang on. 0 0.1 volts. No, what we want is 10. There we go. Bingo. Not a problem whatsoever. Beauty. So that is a really sweet voltage reference. Oh, point zero zero zero. Whoop, five volts. There we go. No whackers. And as you can see, it uses a uh, DAC nine double eight one. So it's basically just a Max sixty three fifty, and that's that is the voltage reference for the DAC. So pretty much uh, the stability of this whole thing is pretty much the combination of the uh, well, is basically the voltage reference. I mean, you know, the DAC. It's, you know, ratio metric, uh, basically, but, you know, it probably requires, you know, extensive characterization and things like that. But for the four decimal places, I think this is going to do the business. And if we hold down the zero button here, we get into our calibration menu and we can actually uh, adjust everything in there. And you can uh, disable the uh, heater if you really uh, want to, but that's uh, not recommended. And um, it recommends you adjust it. Calibration is done in one volt steps, starting at uh, 50 millivolts up to uh, 10 volts so you've got to have you know a, a better matching one i've got a uh, reference uh, lab calibration uh, standard here which can uh, certainly calibrate uh, something like this but out of the box it was bang on so i'm not sure what ian's using but yeah it must be pretty good well that puppy's got winner written all over it and uh if ian's not selling them he probably should um so anyway you can definitely um, download more information, I assume. Like, it's open source, doesn't mention it on here, but yeah, all the info is available, so you can probably uh, make your own, but geez, that's a that's a nice implementation. I reckon you can sell quite a few of those. If he's not selling them, he damn well should. Thanks, Ian. It's awesome. Next up, we've got one from Shenzhen in China. It's from a company you may have heard of, Foscam, and you can probably guess what it is. It is a... <laughs> One layer of bubble wrap. Anyway, it's one of their um, cameras, one of their security cameras. So let's check it out. And what we have here is one of these Foscam HD wireless IP cameras. And um, it three connect, easy link in three easy steps. Well, yeah, that remains to be seen. But uh, yep, um, the I think the only drawback with these Foscans, which is a competitor, you know, compared to sort of drop cam, well, uh, maybe not to drop cam because I was about to say, the um, the main limitation with this is I believe, um, I'm going to have to double check this, but I believe it doesn't have any cloud um, capability. So you can't actually, uh, well, a public, so you can't, you can hook it up to the internet and it works just fine. You can view it on your phone or any computer in the world. Fantastic. But uh, I don't believe you can actually um, let the public um, actually view the thing. They, they don't have the server capability to actually do that. So in that case, in that respect, it's not a competitor to uh, Dropcam, which is a real shame because that's what I need here in the lab. Well, I 
semi stand correct. It does have like a cloud service, but uh, I don't believe it's public. Anyway, let's hook it up and uh, see if it works. It's got uh, Ethernet, or it's wireless as well. It's got uh, Ethernet and uh, it can be powered, uh, presumably powered from the uh, micro USB there. It's got an SD card uh, slot, I think a, a wide angle. 110 degrees, 1 megapixels, um, which is 720p, so they call it, you know, it's not full HD, it's only regular HD, but anyway, it's got two-way uh, audio, so maybe that's mic there, I don't know where the infrared LEDs are, could they be behind the perspex, is it that, I'm not sure, anyway, it's got a built-in uh, per sensor and all that sort of jazz, so it can set to record to the SD card, full security camera, very nice solution, let's give it a burl. Why the hell do I have to sign in to continue? I just scanned the QR code, went to the website, it tells me download the app. I tried to de install, I went install, and I get the stupid sign in. What the, why do I have to bloody sign in? Okay, I've created an account now to install the camera. It's wanting me to scan the QR code on the bottom of it. That's all right, I guess. And my stupid piece of shit phone just locked up. I don't know whether or not that's the app or whether or not it's the phone. This does weird things, this bloody Nexus 4 or whatever it bloody well is, uh, I don't know. And I'm in like Flynn, eventually, um, it took a while after, no, yep, it can rotate, there we go, my camera's, that's actually my uh, arcade machine there, it's just sitting on the shelf because it has to be uh, powered from 5 watt USB, you can see how messy my lab is there, it's terrible Muriel, but it works. I'll tell you what, one thing I really, really like, look, it's telling you how much data, the data rate it's actually using, 32 uh, kilobytes per second. And if you want to see what the uh, night vision things like, those infrared LEDs which uh, surround, yes they are behind that uh, bezel on the front, then uh, here it is. I'll be the ghostly image walking through. And it's not using much uh, data at the moment because it's going to depend, the compression, data compression, and well, data rate, it's going to depend on the uh, complexity of the image and how it's moving. So there's nothing moving at the moment. There's just me. There's my hands waving there. But if I uh, go and uh, jump in front of it, then uh, you'll see it change significantly. There you go. And the little date and timestamp, very nice too. But of course, while the, all this might be fantastic for a, uh, you know, a local security camera and stuff like that, there's my uh, footage and you can record movement. You can, you know, check on your kids or your, you know, your workplace or whatever, you know, you want to check on uh, your home when you're away on holidays, whatever. I'm interested in is can the public actually view my thing and it's got actually public cameras here so I thought this thing actually didn't have the ability to um, uh, that's their headquarters I'm presuming but I thought it didn't have the ability to actually make them publicly available but uh, maybe I'm wrong I hope I'm wrong because yeah oh, there we go <laughs> there we go it's outside the headquarters there's someone riding past on their bike there you go it's uh oh don't know what time of the day it is there in China. It's not too far off um, Sydney, I don't think. What is it, a couple of hours behind or something? Not a big deal. So, yeah, it'd probably be, you know, uh, so, you know, late afternoon there, four or five o'clock. And there we go. You can set up uh, motion detect detection and all sorts of stuff like that. I presume it can email and alert you via the app and all that sort of jazz. So all your standard uh, security type uh, functions. So it's like, yeah, it's okay, it works, it does the business, um, and the image uh, quality and update rates actually are quite good. I, I think it's better than the uh, drop cam I had, but um, yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't, I can't find a way, unless I'm wrong, if you do know a way to publicly make the video available, and by that I mean not just you know, all the requirements come from my server, uh, for example, and my bandwidth here. I don't want to be serving the, the one image, even if it's 35 uh, kilobytes per second. I don't want to be serving that if a 100 or a 1,000 people come in and watch the camera. I don't want to be sucking up my bandwidth here to actually do that. That would be stupid. So, um, yeah, it's a shame it, it doesn't seem to do the same thing Dropcam does, where Dropcam rebuffer the thing and then serve it 
from there. Maybe I can, you know, buffer it and do it on my server or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's not sort of, that's not what this thing is designed for. It's designed as a sort of, you know, a personal type uh, security device for, um, you know, you know, only a few people are going to watch it, either yourself or just a couple of people, not for, you know, hundreds or a thousand people tune in or something like that. So anyway, apart from that limitation, uh, it doesn't seem too shabby at all. It doesn't look like it really comes apart easily. So unfortunately, I can't do a two minute teardown on that that I'm aware of. Is that like ultrasonically welded around the side? It could be. It certainly doesn't seem to come apart. So yeah, there you go. The Foscam. I'll link it in down below if you want one. Next up, one from D Products. That's not the person's name, I'm assuming. Um, that's the name of the company from West Dundee in Illinois. It's very apt then that I'm going to open it with the Crocodile Dundee knife. So let's uh, take a squeeze at this thing. Shame it didn't come from Sherman, Illinois. Da, no, that's it. That's it. It is a interface it's a bluetooth odb to you know one of those odb interfaces for your car i've um i've got a, a similar one it's a lot fancier than this one it looks like it's a yeah yeah bluetooth interface for your car you hook it up and you can access um via an app there it is access via an app all of the uh all the stuff in there all the stuff that you're uh uh, car computer can spit out all your various cars computers on the CAN bus and all that sort of jazz And here we go John sent in one of these little uh, El Cheapo Bluetooth ODB modules So let's go down to the car and plug it in. Um, there's nothing exciting down in here There's a Bluetooth. I won't even bother cracking it open. There's a uh, Bluetooth board Looks like there's the interface board there, little uh, vertical uh, board to board interconnect there, and just basically a Bluetooth interface. Very simple, nothing really that exciting in it. Let's go see what it does on my car. And please excuse the crudity of this. There it is, um, down plugged into my uh, Toyota Corolla here. And um, yeah, it's completely dark down here. My torches bugger all. So let's um, fire it up and see if we can see anything. There's a red light on it. I think it's supposed to be flashing green. Maybe when only when we turn the ignition on, perhaps. And I'm using an app called ODB Car Doctor. Um, it's a free thing, and it's the one that came up first. It had like four or five stars or something. I don't know. And it's designed to use this adapter. We've got the ELM R327, which... Well, that was a complete fail. The light on the thing is supposed to flash green. And uh, sure enough, I call up the Bluetooth uh, things, and I can't find it at all so I've actually got my one here I've got this uh, ODB link um, LX uh, Bluetooth one so let's give this a bell because that generic one just oh, didn't work it's taken its fat time connecting to the car audio too eventually it does yeah there we go it did um, but uh, anyway previously paired device so let's uh, let's see if we can can we do anything I don't know Connect sharing, yep, okay. Let's try that. And it seems this uh, ODB Link LX is also an LM327 uh, compatible one, but this app doesn't seem to um, uh, give me the information that I got using the uh, ODB Link LX um, software that I've done before. Current data? Hmm, vehicle speed. Are we there yet? Oh no. Okay, we're getting there. Yes, it does. There we go. We get, got our battery voltage, 13.8 volts. So the alternator's obviously working and uh, charging the battery. No problems. We can just get in a real-time uh, display there. And we can basically look at uh, anything we like. I'm not going to go drive the thing around. What's my engine currently idling at? There we go. I'm just sitting here idling in the car park. And 780-odd uh, RPM. Is that fairly constant? I don't know. I don't know anything about cars. Sorry. 33% engine load value. So I'm sure for all you car nuts, all this stuff is uh, 
fascinating reading, but for me it's like, meh, you know, I'm not a car person, sorry, couldn't really care much about the catalyst temperature and uh, stuff like that, absolute load value, goodness, accelerator pedal position, I wonder if I can actually, um, uh, yeah, if I can actually rev it and uh, change this absolute throttle pedal, accelerator pedal position, D and E, I've got no idea what the difference is, and there we go, pushing the accelerator and it does change there you go wow woohoo it works so there you go I got no idea why this thing didn't work at all it just flashed its well it didn't it just had its solid red lead and that was it no flashing green lead it wouldn't work and but my other one uh, worked just fine and interfaced with basically any app this ELM 327 actually is from a company called uh, ELM Electronics, and they're like sort of one of the industry standard. Um, uh, it's a pre-programmed micro in here, so it's actually a PIC 18F uh, 2480 in here. So this company produce this micro, which has their own custom protocol in it, and that's what everyone, well, <laughs> most people use, um, and most apps uh, talk to. So as long as you've got basically the Bluetooth interface with that particular uh, ELM327 micro uh, controller pre-programmed micro in it, then pretty much um, any app can talk to any version of these ODB adapters. Check out this one, has to be the smallest package I've ever had here on the blog. And um, yeah, I don't like opening that one with the knife actually, should I? Should I man up and try and open this with a knife? All right, why not? Let's give it a burl. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Let's have a look. Oh my. There's some sort of board. It's wrapped in tissue paper. Okay, I'll give it an A for uh, 3D envelope packaging efficiency. Oh, it's a. <laughs> there is a note. There is a note inside for EV blog. Awesome YouTuber. Thank you very much. Sorry for the paper. EV blog robot. That's the EV blog robot. Um, hi Dave. I really like your videos. Number one. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot from you. I mean only 14. Thank you very much. Like your, um, name. Doesn't have a name. Sorry, I can't credit you, but you're only 14. Awesome. Um, so I'm sending you an old DVD laser scanner and small circuit board and old circuit board from a power supply. And, well, <laughs> is that me? Is that me? Awesome. Thank you, anonymous 14-year-old. Beauty. She looks like the name is chopped off the bottom there. Did I, do th did I do that with the knife? I don't know, but I can't find, can't find any remnant of that at all. So I don't know what happened there. Sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> Thanks. Keep it up. That's what we need. 14 year old hobbyists. Excellent. No, sorry. I've lost it. Oh, fail. Should have used the, yeah. Should have used the Stanley knife. Wah, wah. So apparently this is an old DVD uh, laser scanner and uh, that's just, um, that looks like the driver, uh, the power supply uh, board for it. It's not the laser driver, that's just a main switch mode, but this little puppy must be it down here. I don't know, I haven't seen these before. And there it is, it is tiny tot. Look at that. Wow. So is that the, looks like a, almost like a CCD type uh, thing. I'm not, it's obviously not, but uh, that's kind of what it reminds me of. Very interesting. I've never seen one of those puppies before. So there you go. If anyone knows what the deal is with that, let us know. I'm sure people do. They're uh, familiar with these things, but... Uh, I, off the top of my head, am not. So that's interesting. Is that some sort of little glass prism there? Sort of like a wedge shaped? Absolutely fascinating. Hmm. If anyone knows exactly what that puppy's doing, um, 
please let us know, because that's rather unusual. I haven't seen anything exactly like that before. So thanks to everyone who sent something into Mailbag Monday. I hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time.